الحمد لله وكفى وسلاما على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما ارسلناك الا رحمه للعالمين وقال الله تعالى في مقام اخر ما كان محمد ابا احد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله بخاتم النبيين وقال الله تعالى في مقام اخر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نون والقلم وما يسطرون ما انت بنعمه ربك بمجنون وان لك لاجرا غير ممنون وانك لعلى خلق عظيم وقال الله تعالى في مقام اخر وعلمك ما لم تكن تعلم وكان فضل الله عليك عظيما سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم مثل ربيع الاول um some people they celebrate the birth of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the twelfth of Rabi'u al-awwal first thing is that there's an ikhtilaf in the difference of opinion as to when is the birth of the prophet when is the birth day of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam some say it is 12 but there is an also there is also there is also an opinion that it is on the 8th of Rabi'u al-awwal irrespective the thing is that celebrating the birth of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam none of the sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala anhum explained that in fact none of them yani they did not specify a day for celebrating his birth they celebrated his birth every single day they loved him so much they wanted to see him every day they wanted to see his blessed face they wanted to be with him every day There, there was not a day that they fixed that all right on this day we are going to celebrate something so it is also where it would be very wrong to say this as well that we do not celebrate the birth of the prophet alayhi salam we do but we don't do it on one day we do it every day and we must do it every day because of who he was and who he is sallallahu alayhi wasallam aw sallallahu alayhi wasallam he is that he is that person he is that human being he is that slave of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of whom allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the whole universe he is like the sun he is the source of light you know everything that is light is is it, that is because of the sun the stars have the light because of the sun those sun is you know it's is a star by itself but everything all of the definition of a star is that is a source of light so there has been some sources of light we should not be saying that there was no other source of light all the prophets alayhi wasallam every single prophet is a source of light but they are like stars and prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is that big star he's like the sun and he came with the perfection of light he came with that perfection of light that there was no need for another star after that and that's why he is khatam an nabiyin he is the last prophet because with him the perf- the perfection of everything was completed and everything became perfect after that so just like the stars they come at night come at night so especially if you see in a dark night there are thousands and millions of stars but these stars are not enough to brighten the horizon but then the morning comes and the sun comes out and with the sun everything becomes enlightened 
and there is no need for any other star after that to add on to that light. This is exactly what the relevance is between the Prophet وسلم, and between the previous Prophet. That all of those Prophets were indeed this, the source of light. But then Prophet وسلم, and they, they brightened the horizon of the dunya, they brightened the horizon of this universe. Of course, everybody was the source of light. But then when the Prophet وسلم, he came, he actually perfected that light and there is no need for another star after, after that. This is who he was. This is who he is. And we celebrate his birth every single day. We love him every single day. We follow him every single day. And Sheikh Sa'di, he has written those very, very famous and beautiful verses in his praise. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he says that Balagan Ula Bikamalihi that he attained that exaltation by his perfection. Balagan Ula he attained that exaltation bi kamalihi with his kamal with his perfection kashafat duja bi jamalihi and he dispelled all the darkness by his beauty. When he came then all of the darkness got dispelled because of his beauty. And then he said, Sunat Jami Uqisalihi, that every single quality of his are beautiful. Every single quality that he has is beautiful. Sallu alayhi wa alihi. So it is only right that we all send blessings upon him and his family. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one more thing is that when we talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we talk about the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not become the Messenger of Allah on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal or the 8th of Rabi'ul Awwal. He was made the Prophet 40 years later. That is where his Kamal became perfect. When he achieved Kamal, we would say. That is the time when he actually achieved the Kamal. That's who we follow. That's who we follow, the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam. He was not the Prophet when, he, when Sayyidina Amina Radiallahu Anha gave him the birth. Although he was protected and he was mahfuz and he was ma'asum, but he was not a prophet at that time. So the things that he did at that time, they did not become the shariat. The things became shariat when he was given that kamal, that excellence at the age of 40. And that was, that is what we <coughs> celebrate even more and we must celebrate even more because this is what we all, you know, this is what we all follow. But, one thing is that in order to get that kamal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gave him jamal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his body perfect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made his body with that perfect, gave his body that perfection that actually had to get that kamal, that excellence and, and, and that perfection at the end of the day. Right? Of course, for example, you, yeah, you you decide to give a gift to your wife, for example. Say, for example, a diamond ring. So there are different ways of giving that gift to your to your wife. One is that you take the diamond ring and throw it on her face. What do you think? She's going to like it. Definitely will not. Right? She will say, you know, take away your diamond ring. I don't need that. But then you take that diamond ring and you wrap it in a beautiful wrap, and then you present that. That's the right way of presenting the diamond ring, is it? And if there is something that is that is precious, that is beautiful, then the wrapping and the thing that it is put in should also be beautiful. This is the other. So of course the kamal that Prophet ﷺ was going to get at the end of the day, at the 40 years of his age, of course it was only right that the wrapping is also beautiful. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him jamal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him beauty. And he was very, very beautiful man. And there are two words. One is called jamal and one is called husn. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in one of the hadiths that u'tiya Yusuf alayhi salamu shatr al husn. That Yusuf alayhi salam was given half of husn. And then he said the half Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distributed in the whole universe. Yani every single beautiful thing that you see, the flowers, the clouds, the rain, the greenery, right, beauties and people, some people are given beautiful faces, all of that beauty combined together is half and the half was given to 
Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam. SubhanAllah. You must, now you can imagine how beautiful Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam must have been. Right? So the question is, then does that mean the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was less beautiful than Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam? Right? If half was given to him, half was distributed to the whole universe, and amongst that whole universe is also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he shared the distribution of that half of the beauty. So does that mean that he was less beautiful than Sayyidina Yusuf? It's a question. Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says that, that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so beautiful, he was even more beautiful than Sayyidina Yusuf. That's what she said. You know, that's the famous story of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, that he was so beautiful that he was raised up in the house of Zulaikha. And Zulaikha, she just fell in love with him. And she invited him for, for illegal relations. And she locked all the doors, right? You know that almost, there were seven doors or eight doors that she locked. And she invited him. And what did Yusuf alayhi salam said? He said, Qala ma'az Allah, that I seek protection in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّهُ رَبِّي أَحْسَنَ مَسْوَاهِ He is my Rabb. Or yani your husband who has been taking care of me, he has been my protector, he is my caretaker. How can he has done so many good to me? How can I betray him? And then he ran and he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection and all of those doors got unlocked. So when this news got spread in the town, then the the... the the women of the town, they said, oh, that Yusuf uh, has fallen in love with Yusuf, alayhi salam. So, oh, he is her slave. What is she doing? And she then, when uh, the news got spread so much, she said, all right, I'll tell them that who is he, this man that they are talking about. So she invited all of the women of the town and she gave them a fruit and a knife. That, all right, you know, eat it. And when they were about to cut the fruit, he asked in the Yusuf alayhi salam to come in front of them. And when he came in front of all of them and they looked at Yusuf alayhi salam and they got so mesmerized by his beauty that instead of cutting the fruit, they actually cut their hands. And they did not even realize that they were cutting their hands. And they were so mesmerized in the beauty of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam. Now you can imagine how beautiful Yusuf alayhi salam must have been. That's what Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is saying that the Yusuf al-Islam was given shatrul husn half of beauty of the whole universe. But what does this Sayyidah Aisha say? Radiyallahu anha. Sayyidah Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha. She said that when the friends of Zulaikha, she saw, they saw Sayyidah Yusuf al-Islam, they cut their hands. If they had seen my beloved, yani the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, instead of cutting their hands, they would have cut their hearts. And he was so beautiful. Allahu Akbar. So what does it mean? That Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, he was beautiful, but Yusuf alayhi salam was given half the beauty. So where is, so he got the share of the rest of the beauty. But as I said, there are two words. One is husn, one is jamal. Husn is the beauty of the face. In reality, you know, the beauty is in the face. Beauty is not in, in the, in, you know, in anywhere else. There are some women, they always, they want to prove that why is niqab wajib. Where is the beauty? Beauty is in the face. If the if the face is is not beautiful, then if the other features are you know say say attractive, you know the, the, there will not be that much it, that much attraction. But if the face is beautiful, then the other body parts can be compromised. The actual beauty lies in the face. People you know they don't understand. SubhanAllah, they will wear their, their, their abayas and they will wear their, their scarves, I won't call it hijab, their scarves, and then, then, then they will make up and they will make their eyebrows and SubhanAllah, they think that they are doing hijab. This is not hijab, they are actually portraying their beauty to people. So the beauty, actual beauty lies in the face and person is that. Person is the beauty of the face. That's what Husn is defined as Jamal means the whole perfection. In every single body part is so perfect, is so beautiful, is so handsome. And also that when you look at that, sometimes you look at the beauty. And then later on it becomes so common to you. For example, somebody marries to a wife who is very, very beautiful. But subhanAllah, that beauty is possibly for a month, for, for a few months. 
and you ask them, you know, five years down the road and they're hating each other. Why do they hate each other? SubhanAllah. Right? If she is so beautiful and you married, married her because of her beauty, because she was so good looking, where, where is this hatred coming from then? You should be loving her even now if you marry, if this is something that you like. The thing is that the other things they dominate and the beauty of the face it just gets suppressed and all of the other things. That's the problem. Right? That means that husn is very temporary. Yani the features remain the same. Even though the features remain the same, but now you look at the face and it is not that attractive anymore. Understanding what my point. This is husn. Jamal is that you look at somebody's face and every time that you look at their face, you will find new beauty. This is what Prophet ﷺ had, Jamal. He did not have husn, but rather he had Jamal, which is even more than the, than husn. And that's why that hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when he said that, Inna Allah Ta'ala Jameelun, Yuhibbul Jamal. He did not say, Inna Allah Ta'ala Haseenun, Yuhibbul Husn. He did not say that. He said, Allah Ta'ala is Jameel. He is that beautiful, yani he has, he has the perfection of beauty. And he loves Jama and he loves also that perfection in beauty. In every single thing that you do. So Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was Jameel. He was beautiful, he was so handsome. And Imam Tirmidhi rahmatullah alayhi, in reality, he in fact has, has, has gathered all of those ahadith that Sahaba has narrated about the Jamal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he has gathered in one book. And he's called it Shima'il. Shima'il of Imam Tirmidhi Rahmatullah. Everybody must study that book. Must. I'm not giving you any option. Every single person must. Whoever is a believer, is a Muslim, is a mu'min, must read Shima'il of Imam Tirmidhi Rahmatullah. Because it talks about the beauty of this man, about his qualities, about who he was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And subhanAllah, sahaba actually have Explain every single one of his features. That how were he here? They were wavy here. They were not very curly and they were not very straight. They were wavy. Like something in the middle. He was not very tall and he was not short. He was something in the middle. Every single thing about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was that he was something in the middle. He was, he was, he did not exaggerate either way. He was the most handsome of men. SubhanAllah. They talked about his neck, that how beautiful was his neck. And how how attractive was his neck? You know, Subhanallah. Once Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was making du'a with his ra- hands raised, and he was in ihram. And on the day of Arafat, and took the Sahaba, they actually looked at his armpits, and they realized that how beautiful was were his armpits. They were shining like milk. And Subhanallah. Every single thing about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi outward was beautiful. Every single thing. Sayyidina Hassan bin Sabit radiallahu ta'ala and the beautiful couple, the, the couplets that he wrote, he said, وَأَحْسَنَ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَرَقَتْتُ عَيْنِي That my eyes have not seen anybody more beautiful than you. وَأَجْمَلَ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَلِدِ النِّسَاءُ And no woman has given birth to any baby who is more beautiful than you. خُلِقْتَ مُبَرَّعًا مِنْ كُلِّ عَيْبٍ You have been created free from every single defect. كَأَنَّكَ قَدْ خُلِقْتَ كَمَا تَشَاءُ As you have created, your, you have been created the way you want it. There are people that dream about that my nose should be like this, and my lips should be like this, and my eyebrows should be like this, and that's why women all they make their eyebrows, because they wanted it to be like that. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given all of that as if he created himself, as if he was created the way he wanted. SubhanAllah. Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she used to say that yani, he is so shining, he is so bright. He said, Lana shamsun walil afaqi shamsun. That we have a sun and the sky has a sun. Wa shamsi khayrum min shamsi samai. And my sun is better than the sun of the skies. Fa inna shamsa tatna'u ba'da fajrin. Because the sun of the sky, it comes after fajr. Wa shamsi tatlu ba'da al-ishai. And my sun is always there. My sun comes after fajr and also comes after isha. This is the beauty of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As Sahabi radiyallahu taala anhu. You know, at that time, the beauty of the of the, the the sign of the beauty was supposed to be the full moon. 
So that was such, that was the, the the peak of beauty near Earth, the full moon on a dark, on on a on a bright night. So once the Sahabi came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sultan in Shimal of, of Imam Tirmidhi, Rahmatullah he says that I came to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on a, on, a, on a night of full moon, on a bright night. And he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very uh, clothes that had red and white stripes, possibly wearing a shawl. And he said that the full moon was shining right behind him. And he said it was a beautiful scene. I looked at him and I looked at the full moon. And then I looked at him and I looked at the full moon. And again I looked at him and I looked at the full moon. And after looking at both of them, I realized that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is more beautiful than the full moon. This is his beauty. The way that Allah, he, Allah Ta'ala made his teeth and his nose and his ears and his face and his chest and his limbs. Everything was beautiful about him. He was manly, but he was not old, like he was not exaggerated in that. He was so he was he was manly, but he was also soft. The water when he would make wudu, the water would just slip from his blessed skin as if it is oily. Subhanallah. Every single thing about the Prophet Sallallahu outfit was 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 beauty was beauty, but that beauty was given to him because Allah Ta'ala was to fill him with command. And that came years later. After it was, he became 40 years of age, that was the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him to get, give him that spiritual excellence, that command. And that is something that we must celebrate. That when he was given that command, he was given that excellence, the spiritual excellence. And in order to keep that command, and this command was not only in one thing, this command was in everything. And as I said that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to fill him with that spiritual excellence, one thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also did to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam is that Allah ta'ala kept him absolutely blemish free. He was marzoom, he had that ismat. And every Prophet has ismat, every Prophet is marzoom. Our aqidah is that every Prophet is marzoom. What is ma'asun? That they have ismat. What does it mean? It means that they can never sin. They can never sin. Absolutely not. You know, all the things that we study in history, that Adam and Islam, that he ate the, eat of, uh, ate the fruit of a tree, that has been, that has been prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or, or Sayyidina Yunus alayhi salam, he left the city without getting the orders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the fish, the way he ate him. They were not sins. Sins is that you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purposely, intentionally, knowing that it is the disobedience of Allah and I'm doing it. That is sin. That these things that they did were their ijtihad. These were their that their decision, that was the decision that they made based on the ilm that they had. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says about Adam alayhi salam that Adam alayhi salam never intended to disobey me. I did not find any, uh, any irada in his heart to disobey me. That was his, his, his ishtihad because he was told by Shaitan that alright, you know, Allah Ta'ala only allowed you to not eat from this one one specific tree, you can eat from any others like this. And then he was also told that, oh, if you eat the fruits of any of, of the similar trees, then you will get the close proximity of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala forever. And, and he did it out of that, that was, that was his ishtihad, that was not a sin. So you know, Yunus alayhi salam also thought that Allah, that the azab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is about to come because these people are not listening, so I'm, I should rather leave the city. That was his ishtihad. A prophet can never sin. If anybody does not believe in that, then his iman is in danger. In fact, if, I, if his iman, I mean, if he is doing it purposely, then of course his iman is gone, but if he misunderstands that, then he, he has to fix that. Because uh, this is our aqidah, a prophet can never ever sin. They are ma'asum, they have ismat. <coughs> One of the reasons is that, that the prophet, you know, all of us are made out of dust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made every single person out of dust. And the, 
the, the bodies of the Prophet ﷺ, they are made out of the dust of the heaven, of the, of, of the paradise. They are also mixed up with this, the, the dust of this dunya as well. But the dominant dust that is uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used in the creation of the prophets is from the paradise. And there is an usul that kullu shay'in yadji'u ila aslihi. That every single thing it returns to it, asal, to its roots. That's why when we die, what, 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 what do we do? What do we do? We bury the dead body. Why? Because the body is made out of dust and it must go back to its original form. It must go back to its origin. Kullu shay'in yadji'u ila aslihi. Everything returns. To it's asal. This is this is a statement that is mashhur, that is very famous in Arab. So, because the dominant aspect of the prophets is the dust of the paradise, and the paradise is all about goodness, so that's why there is not even an attraction in their in their personalities towards anything that's bad, that anything that's evil, anything that's indecent. It's not even there. And me and you, all of us, because our asal is this dust, the dust of this dunya, and this dunya is low. This dunya is a lowly place. And, you know, the asal is the high place, is akhir, the high place is paradise. And that's what we want to get. And we don't want to absorb ourselves only in this dunya, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not even look at this dunya with, with a sight of mercy. Right? This is such a low place. And our... Our creation has been made from the dust of this dunya. That's why if we leave it as such, then it returns to lowliness. If we leave it, if we do not work on our hearts, if we do not work on ourselves, if we do not struggle with ourselves, if we do not make a struggle to get to paradise, what happens? Then this, this nafs, the, the, our, our bodies, they incline towards evil. That's what Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam said, in the nafsa la ammaratum bisu, that every nafs, every person, he is inclined towards evil. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. That every person is inclined towards evil. Why? Because we are made out of the dust of this dunya, which is a low place. And the prophets are made out of the dominant so the their their dominant part of their body is made out of the dust of the paradise, which is a high place. That's why the prophets cannot even sin. So, anbiya are ma'asum. So, remember that. This aqeedah. Anbiya are ma'asum. Awliya are mahfuz. There are two different terminologies. Anbiya are ma'asum. Awliya are mahfuz. What is the difference? Difference is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps the sins away from the prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps the sin away from the prophet. And from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps the awliya away from the sins. Two things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps the <coughs> anbiya, the prophets, away from, the, sorry, Allah ta'ala keeps the sins away from the prophets, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps awliya away from the sins. Yani they do get the environment of the sin, the awliya, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them tawfiq that they don't sin, even in the, they are in the environment of sin. And, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even keeps the prophets away from, Allah ta'ala keeps the sins away from the prophets. Yani they don't even, <coughs> They don't even get the opportunity to sin. This is the week of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are two things. So one, the asal is from paradise. So they even if they let themselves lose, the inclination will be toward good things. Right? Number one. And number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the week on top of that, that they don't even get the opportunity to sin. So this is how much protection Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the Prophet. Why is that? The reason is that if they're the, before, even before they are the prophets, right? Even when they are before the prophets, they don't sin. Why? Because if they were sinning, say for example, if they were sinning, then when they were made the prophets, people would have raised fingers. Oh, what are you talking about? This is what who you were. Who are you to say all of us, all of this to us, right? But Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala have made them like that that even that before they were prophets, nobody will raise any objection on their character. This is what was, what was about Prophet ﷺ. People used to call him as a sadiq al-amin. He's the most truthful man and he's the most trustworthy man. Right? People will actually call him for their, for their decisions. 
We all know this very famous incident when the Kaaba was rebuilt and it was a time to to put on the black stone in the corner of the Hadar Aswad and there were four major tribes and everybody wanted that this honor comes to their tribe. And they were discussing this matter amongst themselves. They were not able to decide suddenly the Prophet who was not a prophet at that time, he entered. And they said, oh, you know, a sadiq al-ameen, a sadiq has come. Let ask him for decision. And then he came and then subhanAllah, what a thing that he did. He said, all right, bring a piece of cloth, put Hajar Aswad on that. All of the four tribes, their leaders, they pick up one corner each. And let's all take it to the Kaaba. And when they all took it to the Kaaba, and Prophet Sallallahu with his own blessed hand, he picked the Hajar Aswad in the corner of the Kaaba. So he, everybody <coughs> knew him as, the, as, the, as, as, the, as a beautiful man. And Allah Ta'ala protected him many, many times. Once Prophet Sallallahu was saying that I was around 12 years of age, like a, getting into the teenage. And I was, I was with, uh, with other boys. And there was a wedding that was to what was happening in Makkah Mukarramah. And he said, all right, we all boys thought, let's go to the wedding party. And he, he said that there was uh, going to be some sort of entertainment in that wedding as well. Like some dance, music, all of that. But it was to happen at night, then after the sunset. You know, so, so the, he said that we all went and we ate. And then we were waiting for that. And suddenly he said that it felt so drowsy. The, the sleep overcame me and I slept and I kept on sleeping the whole night. And when he got up, then all of those things were over. And the wedding was finished and, and all of that thing was over and did not even hear anything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him like that, that all right, he was thinking that or what he was just exploring, you know, 12 year of age, a teenage boy trying to explore what's happening around. But that's all this. We did not intend to sin. He just went there, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even saved him from that, from that opportunity. When the Kaaba was built, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, he went. And subhanahu wa ta'ala, there was very ajeeb thing that these people did, that they thought, because there were floods that came and, and the foundations had become weak, and they thought of rebuilding the Kaaba. So, but they, they thought that our money, we, we gamble, we take interest money. So they, th- they said, let's not use uh, our haram money in the building of the Kaaba. And they said, all right, let's bring all the pure money and we'll only use our pure money for the building of the Kaaba because they believed it, that it's the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although they did shirk. So, but they did not have enough money that they could build the Kaaba on the foundation of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. So they they reduced the size, but they kept it, the, the, the rest of it, outside, and they built a hatim, the semicircle that we still see. So, by the way, people who don't know that, you know, the place be- between the wall of the Kaaba and between where the hatim starts, that thing is actually part of Kaaba. That thing is actually part of the Kaaba. So, if anybody goes and pray in that place, not in the semicircle, in uh, between the wall of the Kaaba and where the semicircle starts. So you enter from that place. This place is the part of the Kaaba. So if you pray there, it is as if you're praying inside the Kaaba. So, so this is the reason that they short, they reduced the size of the Kaaba because they did not have enough money. So after they built it, now this, and, and, all right, the second thing that they thought, which was very unintelligent, they thought that all oh, the clothes that we wear, they also made it, we also have bought it out of haram money. So it is not good that we should wear these clothes while building the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's take off these clothes. Let's become naked and then we will make the, the Kaaba. So, I mean, I don't know why didn't they think that all right, this flesh is also made out of haram money. <laughs> so let's scratch away some flesh as well. So but this is what they thought. So they took off their clothes and they started building the Kaaba naked. <coughs> Prophet ﷺ went and he said, Oh Muhammad ﷺ, let's come join. Right? But he said, Oh, it's our, you know, we should take off our clothes. Right? Because of this very reason. And Prophet ﷺ, because, I mean, all of these were elders, and of course there was no shariat at that time. Right? There was no shariat at that time. There was no shariat that you have to, men have to cover between navel and the knees. So he ﷺ, decided, all right, all of my elders are doing that. First he felt very shy. 
He was very naturally, very, very shy person. He felt shy. But when they in, insisted, encouraged, and he thought all of these elders are doing it on some small young person. These are elders. So, uh, and there was no as per definition in the Sharia because Sharia was not even there. So he decided to take off his clothes. As soon as he decided to take off his clothes, he said that as if somebody has picked me up and he's thrown me on the ground. And he fell in unconscious. He became unconscious right there and then. Allah Akbar. And he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even protected him at that point. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always protected him from any sort of wrong thing. That was, that <coughs> almost to be made part of Sharia later on. So music, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped him from listening to music because that was to become haram later on. A nakedness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stopped him from, from revealing himself because that was become, going to become haram later on. That's very interesting. So one of the people don't even consider this is one of the biggest fitnas of our time. On a, on a side note, this is the biggest fitna of our time. People, they don't even want to wear anything anymore. This is, that, that is against fitrat. That is against fitrat that people don't cover themselves anymore. Prophet sallallahu had that natural shyness, that natural haya. Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said that, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was more modest than even the unmarried girls of that time. Yani the married girls that were not married were supposed to be, supposed to be the model of modesty at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yani in the, in the times of Islam. And Sayyidah Aisha said radiallahu anha that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had even more modesty than those girls. <coughs> this was his nature. He was very naturally shy man. This is because he was from paradise. His, his dust Dominantly was paradise, and the and the quality of the paradise is shyness, <laughs> is shyness, and subhanallah, so any people they are going against fitr, against nature, and they are just taking off clothes. One of the hadiths of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that clothes in the day of judgment, women will be kasiyat ariyat, kasiyat and ariyat. What does it mean? Yani they will be wearing clothes, but they will be naked. And ulama have given a lot of explanation of that and some have said that they will be actually wearing clothes but that will be so small that they will be naked and the second is that they will be wearing so thin clothes that they, 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 they you can actually you will actually be able to see their skin and you will be able to see their see-through clothes and one is that they are it, they'll be so tight clothes that they will just be as somebody's wrapped something around their body or somebody has painted the body exactly that's what you know, people do very tight clothes, tight jeans, tight tops. You know, you every single body part is so apparent, or they're wearing so thin clothes that they are all see-through clothes. You can actually see, you know, what's inside. So this is what Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said: They are kasiyat ariya. They will be wearing clothes, but they will be naked. And and women think that they are looking attractive in that. That's why they wear it. Subhanallah. And this hadith continues, this is ma'ilat mumilat, that these women, by doing that, they will be ma'ilat, they will get attracted towards other men, and they will be mumilat, they will be attracting others towards themselves. And Prophet sallallahu has said that these women will never enter into paradise. Because of doing something that's against sharia, which is revealing yourself. And also men, subhanAllah, I mean, we have in our sharia that we must cover between our navel and the knee. And we don't even realize that. SubhanAllah, people, they, want, they play football, and football, they are wearing shorts, and their, their thigh is revealed. And they don't even know that they are, they're naked. Nakedness is defined by sharia, my friend. We don't define it. It's not that we just wear, cover our private part. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has defined nakedness for men. And that is between the navel and the knees. That is sata. That is something that <laughs> must be kept hidden. And when people, they wear Muslims, they wear shorts and their thighs are revealed, they are naked. We need to understand that very well. And subhanAllah also it means that we cannot even look at the nakedness. We cannot also look at the sata, be, be it of men or women. In fact, Prophet ﷺ, he 
has even prohibited to look at the private parts of the animals. Forget about the for human beings. So when we looking at the satar of others is also haram. So that means, I'm sorry to make it difficult, but shariat is shariat. And that means watching football games on the TV. I mean, all of these men who are wearing shorts, they're naked. If they're, the shorts are not long enough. So that means it's also haram to look at that. If you're able to keep your gaze only at the, at the football, that's fine. But then good luck. It's difficult. But it's haram to look at the satar of anybody. So this is a sin. Music is a sin. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, he came to, it is one of the hadiths that he said that I came to break the musical instruments. Because musical instruments, it put people into ghaflats. That's what happens. It takes people out of the state of zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it puts people into ghaflat. How many are the people who have said that they have done tawbah from the sins that they have been doing? Right? But they say that any time I walk into a, a supermarket, into a mall, and it's their favorite music that they used to like, is played in the background. He said, I cannot avoid that. So many people have said that. And that's so true. <coughs> they said, I cannot avoid that. That I listen to some um, some song that I used to listen in the time of my ignorance. And I just cannot avoid any. Some of them have said that I even start singing along with that unintentionally. This is the how disastrous is music. Honestly, it is very, very dangerous thing. People don't e- realize the effect of music and the song. It gets into your system. It just gets into your heart. Very difficult to scratch scratch it out right until the bottom. Very, very difficult. Possibly impossible. Allahu A'lam. Possibly impossible. Because the things that you have listened through poetry and through music, that like haram songs, haram music, music every music is haram except that, and that's also ulama not encouraged is for just general uh, general uh, beating. But this is how disastrous is music, my friends. Please, it is it is something that's haram. And both of these things, like I'm just giving examples, both of these things, music and nakedness, because they were to become haram in Sharia, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala even protected the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam even when he was not the Prophet. So he had that ishqat. He had that pureness. And one more thing, you know, why is he made out of the dust of paradise? The reason he is because this, when you become the dust of paradise, you, you are made out of the dust of paradise, your inclination is towards goodness. And because, because of this inclination toward goodness, and he naturally his inclination, inclination was about to be towards goodness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made every single thing that he did shariat. Right? Not only his ibadat, not only his prayers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made every single thing that he did shariat. The way that he ate, the way that he drank, the way that he walked, the way that he interacted with people, the way that he smiled, the way that he sat, the way that he stood up. Every single thing that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did became shariat. SubhanAllah, why? Because he is inclined towards goodness by default. That is the reason. And that's exactly what Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْبَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ That in the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is your role model. Whoever believes in Allah, whoever, whoever, believes, whoever wants to have that meeting with Allah and whoever believes in the Day of Judgment. He is the role model. Yani he is from paradise. You want to go into paradise? He is the person of paradise. He is dust is made out of paradise. Alright, every single thing that he does, it's an action of paradise. If you want to be entered into paradise, follow this man. He is the role model. You want to stand up, you want to walk? Look at this man. He is, his walk is like the walk of paradise. What is that walk? وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا Humble walk. This is the walk of this man. Follow this walk if you want to become the 
you don't want to become the people of paradise because this action, this walk is from the from the act, walk of the paradise. You want to smile? Smile like this man, not like LOLs. That's not his laugh. There's no laughing out loud. His laugh is a smile. Big smile, so much so that you could actually see his molar teeth. But that said, he was not laughing out loud. Ha, 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 ha. He was not doing that. Because laughing out loud is, is a sign of needlessness <coughs> and he is the person of zikr. If you want to have the smile, have the laugh of the people of paradise, look at his smile. If you want to eat like the people of paradise, look at how he's eating. If you want to drink like the people of paradise, look at us as to how is he drinking. If you want to interact with people like the people of paradise, look at as to how did he interact with people. Every single thing that he does is from the people of paradise because he's made out of the dust of paradise. And that's why he's the role model for all of you. You want to go into paradise? Follow this man. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Allah Ta'ala is saying to the Prophet Sallallahu you want, tell the people that if they claim to love Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, then follow me. Do my ittiba, footstep by footstep. Every single thing that I did, do that, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will love you, and Allah Ta'ala will forgive you of your sins. Allah Akbar. This is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, this is what we need to do on maulids. Every single day is our maulid, and every single day we need to follow this man, not having some conferences, some seminars, some gatherings, and people will just recite some nats, and people will just talk about some sirat and subhanallah people, you know, they will just go back home and continue living the life that they were living. What sort of maulid is that? What is the reason for that maulid? Ajay, I never understood that. SubhanAllah, I've even seen there are people who would be reciting Naat and you will not, they're not even following Sunnahs. Clean shaven, shaven people reciting Naats, coming on the TV and coming in the gatherings and SubhanAllah. Gee, with that happening, people will come and they will take out the, you know, the, the bills, the notes and they will be just... Have you seen these sort of things, SubhanAllah? Welcome to subcontinent. So this is what Prophet ﷺ had, innocence. He had Jamal, he had the beauty, and that he had the innocence. Why? Because he was to get that spiritual perfection. He had to get that spiritual perfection. And what and and at the at the time of the Prophet and when he was made the Prophet, then his ahwal, the spiritual excellence, became at came at became at his peak. He got the excellence in his spirituality. That's what he became. That's what was given to him in the cave of Hira. You know, at the time when he became 40, and by the way, 40, what is about so good about 40? 40 is the time when people get mature. Before that, people are still kiddish. They are still like sort of learning. 40 is the age of maturity. And that's why after one becomes 40 years of age, then things become so firm in people that it becomes a little difficult, little difficult, I would say, to change their personality. So every, every, everybody who is under 40, there is still some time. But people who are over 40 like myself, well, I'm trying very, very hard. Because it just gets into your system in 40. But 40 is a mature age. So Prophet Sallallahu at the age of 40, Allah Ta'ala started putting in his head that, all right, you know, this is all fake. This dunya is fake. So he just got cut off from the dunya and went into the cave of Hira. And in the cave of Hira, he was just you know, reflecting. <coughs> he was doing tafakkur. He was reflecting on the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was reflecting on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was in the state of zikr all the time. He had that zikr and that fikr. He had that remembrance of Allah ta'ala and fikr in the creation of Allah. And he was realizing that everything is fake and real is something else. And that is the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, gave him the, gave him the spiritual excellence. Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam came. And he asked him, we all know the story, I don't want to go, go into it. He came with Iqra, read, recite. He showed him the ayat of the Quran, recite, read. And Jamana Biqari, I'm a literate fan. I cannot know, I don't know, I've never been to a teacher, I've never been to school, I don't know. I mean, how can he even hear a teacher? A person who is going to be the teacher of humanity, how can he have a teacher? Otherwise, teachers normally are always better than the students. Right? If he had a teacher, 
then people would have said, all right, he is the teacher, so he is the teacher of that teacher, so he is better than him. Allah Ta'ala did not give him a teacher. Allah Ta'ala became his teacher. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he taught him. He said, Iqra, and Mara Biqari, I don't know how to recite, I'm illiterate man, I'm ummi. And then he asked him to recite three times, and he was not able to do that, then Sayyidina Jibra'il al-Islam, he hugged him, he squeezed him. It comes in Hadith and say in Bukhari that he squeezed him so much that he said that I felt <coughs> as I'm going to die. That it was so hard squeezing. And then he said that Jibrail they did it three times and then suddenly he started reciting. That's also very amazing. What happened? That hugging, that squeezing, in reality was that the vajjo, that spiritual attention that Jibra'il al-Islam gave to him, and he actually transferred that nur that he brought from that alam, the other room, and he brought that nur and he put that into his heart, and suddenly his heart expanded. And he started reciting, اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق, خلق الإنسان من علم, اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم. A deep thing happened. I mean, we don't reflect on to, or into all of these things. Can we realize what was happening? A deep. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time gave him spiritual excellence. And one of the things that is also required in getting that spiritual excellence is that you have ilm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had, had given him the perfect aql. He had the perfect intellect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, so his jism, his body, his jamal, became the source of his, his you know, it, it, Allah Ta'ala gave him the spiritual excellence by giving it ikhlaq. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave him aql which was perfect as well and Allah Ta'ala gave, put ilm in that. Understood? So that Jamal, when that was given the spiritual excellence, the perfection, then Allah, then the ikhlaq came out of that. The beautiful characteristics, the beautiful qualities came out of that. And Allah Ta'ala also gave him that perfect intellect and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave him that ilm. And this is spiritual excellence, the ikhlaq and the ilm. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that, uh, that what is that? وَعَلَّمَكَ مَا لَمْ تَكُنْ تَعْلَمْ I taught you what you, were, what you did not know. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala taught him every single thing. Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa also says in one of the hadiths that Uti to ilm al-awwaleen wal akhireen I was given the ilm of what came before and what came, what is going to come next. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given the perfection of ilm. One interesting point is that despite of that, Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, O my Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, make dua, qul, Rabbi zidni ilma. Ya Allah, increase in my knowledge. Achieve. This is the power of ilm and this is the importance of ilm near Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everybody must study ilm of deen. Everybody must do that. Ilm of deen is a very, very powerful thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises the ranks of the people of ilm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ Darajat that Allah ta'ala raises the ranks of the people of iman and the people of ilm. So please, everybody must study ilm of deen. But this is what Allah Ta'ala, the spiritual excellence of the Prophet Sallallahu was two ways. One was in his jamal. <coughs> How did it become perfect? By giving him the perfect of, the perfection of, character of ikhlaq. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave him the spiritual excellence in his aql, in his intellect by giving him the ilm. By giving him the ilm. And subhanAllah, and then his ahwal, his spiritual states were on a different realm. Ikhlaq, we all know how did his ikhlaq, how beautiful was it, were ikhlaq. Hasuna jami'u khisali. Every single thing that he did was beautiful. Every single thing. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the way that he was tortured, the way that he was harmed. He himself says, by the way, that I am, the way that I am harmed, nobody else was harmed. And what did he do at the end? When he was given the opportunity to take revenge, what did he say? I said, There is nothing on you, no blame on you, go. This is his ikhlaq. Allahu Akbar Kabir. Another question is, you know, the question can be, he is saying that I was harmed in the way that nobody else was harmed. 
And if you look into Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam, he gave da'wah for 950 plus years and right <coughs> around 70 people, they accepted his call. And everybody made fun of him, nobody accepted his call. And so much so that eventually he had to made, make a dua, a bad dua for his people that Allah Ta'ala's punishment comes on to them. So it looks like that he was harmed more. Why is Prophet Sallallahu saying by the way, that he is more harmed than anybody else. What do you think? The reason that he is saying that he is harmed more than anybody else because he loved his people more than anybody else. Right? If I'm going on the street and somebody makes fun of me, he passes a comment that is not good. I will feel bad about it possibly, but I will just ignore. He is just a person walking on the street. Who cares? But if one of you, they come and they start making fun of me, what do you think? What will happen to me? Oh my God. And this person that I know him so well, I love him so much. And this person that I love so much, he is making this, he is giving the same, passing the same comments. Same comments. The comments will be the same. But the harm that I will, the, 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 the psychological harm that I will get, from his comments, same comments would be far, far more than that person's comments on the street. This is exactly what happened. Prophet Wasallam loved these people so, so much that when they rejected him, when they tortured him physically, when they passed comments, Prophet Wasallam, his state was absolutely different than any other prophet that came before him. Allah Ta'ala also says that in the Qur'an. That a prophet has come to you. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that a prophet has come to you. That anything that goes wrong, that goes bad with you, he feels so bad about it. Allah ta'ala is saying it. He feels it. Harisun alaykum is always worrying about you, concerned about you, about your benefit. Bil mu'minin ra'uf rahim and for the believers, he is very merciful. He's very, very merciful. He's very caring for believers. And yani this is the state of the heart of the Prophet ﷺ for people. He loved people very, very much. And because of his love for people, when these people tortured him, when these people made fun of him, when these people passed comments on him, it was more than anybody else. That's what he said that I was harmed more than anybody else was harmed. But still is ikhlaq, Allah Akbar. The Jews, you know, they, they came and they tortured him. Even the Bedouins, you know, who did not know the other. One Bedouin came and he... Prophet Sallallahu was going somewhere and he was wearing a shawl. And he came and he, he pulled him from his shawl from the back. So much so that he, there was a mark on his neck because of his pulling of the shawl. And he turned and said, what's up? And Sayyidina, Sayyidina Sahaba, especially Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala, he was very upset, what are you doing? And he said, no, 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 don't do anything. He said, well, what do you want? He said, oh, I also want to share in the distribution of what you were distributing the wealth. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he just smiled. He said, all right, give it to him, what does he, whatever he wants. SubhanAllah, just imagine that we are walking and somebody pulls us from the back. What will be our reaction? People will start calling names. This is the reaction of people. And here is his ikhlaq. The way that he was dealing with his wives. The way that he loved his wives. The way that he dealt with children. The way that he dealt with orphans. The way that he dealt with widows. The way that he dealt with the believers and the way that he dealt with non-believers. The way that he dealt with munafiqeen, the hypocrites. The hypocrites were the worst of the people. The way that they harmed believers, nobody else harmed. Because they were acting like Muslims and in reality they were not Muslims. So the Muslims were thinking that they are from amongst them and they will actually come and, and, and listen to all of what they were talking about and they'll go back and it will tell the mushrikeen that this is what Muslims are planning. They harm the people the most. And the leader of Munafiqeen was Abdullah bin Ubay. And Abdullah bin Ubay, when he passed away, his son came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah, my father has passed away and he loved his father. And he was a Munafiq that everybody knew that he's a Munafiq. And when he 
passed away, his son came, that Ya Rasulullah, my, son, my father has passed away, can you give me your shirt so that I can make his kafar out of your shirt? He was so concerned about him. Prophet Wasallam took off his shirt and gave it to his son. <laughs> and then he came, he said, Ya Rasulullah, can you please read the janaza of my father? So then Rasulullah said, said alright, I'll go and read the janaza. And he came and he stood. And Sayyidina Umar came. Radhi Allah and he said, Ya Rasulullah, what are you doing? Don't you know who is he? He said, I know who is he. I know who is this man. Why are you praying this janaza? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me an option in the Quran. He is saying, if you make forgiveness, if you make dua of istighfar for them, or you don't make dua of istighfar for them, I'm not going to forgive them. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. That if you make dua or you don't make the dua, I'm not going to forgive them. So Allah Ta'ala has not said to me, you don't make dua of istighfar. Allah Ta'ala is giving me an option, why should I do istighfar for them? Subhanallah. This is his de- dealing with munafiq. <coughs> and the t- in day of Ahad, we all know what happened. You know, the, the whole chaos that happened and the mushrikeen, they actually eventually they got an opportunity and he, they hit the Prophet ﷺ with stones. And then the sahaba who were protecting him or guarding him, you know, they were actually jumping and catching the arrows that were hit at him. But they, were, they couldn't even think that possibly the stones could come. And they hit him with stones and subhanAllah one stone came and he hit the face of the Prophet ﷺ. And his two teeth, they got shaheed. And he was bleeding and he actually fell and he hit his... his he hit the head, the rock with the head, and he got unconscious. And he, when he, and Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anumajma'in, they thought that he had been martyred. And there was even more chaos in the whole army. And then he got up, and subhanAllah, one Sahabi radiallahu anhu, he picked him on his shoulders and he took him to a cave to protect him. And he was so weak, so lethargic because of so much bleeding, that he could not even stand up and pray. Imagine! So there were like literally, you know, people were after him to kill him. Almost murderers, isn't it? And the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in, when they looked at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in that state, bleeding, you know, teeth got shaheed, couldn't even stand up, so lethargic, a jeep stayed. They couldn't take it. His Ya Rasulullah make a dua for them, make a dua of azaf for them. It was only right that he could, would have raised his hands at that time. The people who were after his life, that he, he should have made dua. What did he say? Ya yeah, Allah, guide my people. Allah, Allah, mahdi qawmi. Fa innahum la ya'lamun. Ya Allah, guide these people. They don't know what are they doing. They don't know what are they doing. They don't know I'm a prophet. Ya yeah, Allah, guide them. Ya yeah, Allah, forgive them. This is his ikhlaq. Ajeeb. Perfection of ikhlaq. Noon. Bal qalami wa ma yasturoon. Ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. These people are calling you majnoon, a man, man. By the grace of Allah, you're not majnoon. Allah Ta'ala is saying, I'm telling you, you're not majnoon. Wa innaka la ajran ghayr mamnoon. You're going to get a lot of reward from Allah Ta'ala for what they are saying to you. And then, wa innaka la ala khuluqin azim. You're in such a vast character, my beloved. You're a beautiful character. You're God in this body, this jamal, this beautiful body that you have. Now it has become so perfect after you have been given the prophecy that it is the model of, of ikhlaq. This is the, the excellence of ikhlaq in it. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants in everybody. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants in everybody. The intellect that everybody has given, go and get the ilm of deen. Because Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got the ilm of deen, he was given the perfection of knowledge and the beautiful intellect that he had, the beautiful mind that he had the beautiful brain that he had, and his beautiful body, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala filled it up with the excellence of his life. This is what he wants. So please, this is what we need to remind ourselves of. Not only in Rabbi al-Awwal, but in Rabbi al-Sani, and Jamadi al-Awwal, and Jamadi al-Sani, and Rajab, and Sha'ban, and Ramadan, and Duqada, and Dhul-Hajjah, and Muharram, and Shawwal, every single day, we should remind ourselves of this. This is the goal of our life, my friends. Zindagi ka maqsad jahi hai. Bas, how can we become like the Prophet? <coughs> this is the goal of life. How can we become like him? If you want the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fattabi'uni. 
If you want to become like somebody, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا In him is your role model. Follow him. Your face, your dress, the way that you walk, talk, eat, drink, every the interactions, dealing, forgiving, loving, caring, everything should be like the Prophet ﷺ. This is our goal. This is what we should work towards. Because if we don't work on ourselves, on our hearts, then what will happen? Because we are made out of this dust and we will become low and we have already become low. Because we are not working on ourselves, our inclination is toward the lowliness. And if we want to become people of paradise, <coughs> then we have to become like the Prophet ﷺ because he is the person of paradise. We have to develop our ikhlaq like himself, like, like him. We have to develop ourselves like him. This, is, this needs an effort, this takes an effort. But we must make that effort. And one more thing, by the way, his spiritual ahwal, the kafiyat that he had, we also try to develop that. Right? His ibadah, the way that he did worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because of his extensive standing at night of prayers, his, his feet would swell and they would break up. And she was so concerned that what's happening? He's exerting so much. And she said that, Ya Rasulullah, why do you do that? Why do you do that? For you have been forgiven for any shortcoming that you might have done in the past or you may do in the future. Allah Ta'ala has said in the Quran, you have been forgiven for that. Why do you exert so much? What did he say? Oh, shouldn't I become a grateful slave of Allah? I do it out of my love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. I don't need to do it for anything else. This love we also should develop in our hearts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that comes to zikr. We must do extent, extensive zikr so that our prayers will become of that nature. So that every single moment will become of that nature. This is what we need to do. This is the effort that we must bring in our life. This is the goal of our life. Nothing else. When people, the mazin will call azan, subhanAllah will go into a totally different world. He was once sitting with Sayyidah Aisha and they were talking and suddenly say, the Muazzin, he gave the Adhan. And suddenly his face changed and Sayyidah Aisha, she realized that he is not listening to me anymore. And he, she said something. He said, Ya Rasulullah. He said, who are you? Maranti. He said, Aisha. Mara Aisha. Who is Aisha? Ya Rasulullah, daughter of Abu Bakr. He said, Mara Abu Bakr. Who is Abu Bakr? <laughs> Sayyidah Aisha realized he is in a different room now. And it's better not to talk. Allah Ta'ala is calling Hayya ala salah, Hayya ala al-falas. As-salatu khayrun min al Every single morning the mu'azim calls. The prayer is better than sleep. And here are we snoring. SubhanAllah. This is our state. The vakkul that he had, reliance on Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. On the day of Badr, 313 people were going to fight with a thousand fully equipped people. And they had nothing. They had the branches of the trees. Going with complete tawakkul, only reliance on Allah. Didn't have anything, really, absolutely, almost any, nothing in, in, in comparison to what the other people had. And subhanAllah, what did he do? Prophet sallallahu he, he raised his hands at night. The next day was the, was the battle. He raised his hand, he started crying, he started crying, he started crying, he cried so much. Ya Allah, if these small little group of people, if they, they, they destroy, they are killed, then there will be nobody who will take your name in the future. Ya Allah, protect them. And he cried and he cried and he cried. So much so that Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu looked at the Prophet he got that yakin, that certainty that the help of Allah will indeed come. And he came, Hasbukta Rasulullah, enough Ya Rasulullah. He held his head. He patted on his back. Ya Rasulullah, enough. Why are you exerting so much? <coughs> Allah Ta'ala's help will indeed come. SubhanAllah, how much tawakkul that he had. And exactly that happened. Next day, the, he went into the battlefield. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent, sent angels who came and who fought. And the army, the other army thought that there's so many. They, the, all of the Muslims, they got into their hearts. <coughs> SubhanAllah. Tabakkul, reliance on Allah, Iman, Kefiyat, Ahwal, Ikhlaq, Ilm, 
This is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He is our spiritual father. Ma kana Muhammadun aba. What is aba? Ahadim min rajalikum. He is not anybody's father. He is not anybody's biological father. Walakin Rasul Allah. He is your spiritual father. He is the messenger of Allah. Wa khatam min nabiyin. And he is the seal of the prophets. The sun has come. There is no need of any other light anymore. There's no need of any other star. The previous prophets had come. They were like stars and they beautified the horizon. And they were so beautiful and they were the source of light. They were the guarding light. They were the, the, the guiding stars, all of them. But now the sun has come out. The sun has come out. There's no need for any other star. There's no need for any other prophet. Yes, the guides will come. The ulama will come and the mashayikh will come later on who will be the inheritors of the prophets but they will not have any light of their own absolutely but they will be taking the light from that, that sunlight. So you take guidance from them but their guidance will be coming from his guidance. He is the son. There is no need. He is your spiritual father. Get your spirituality from him. Get your inheritance from him. Become, learn and develop yourself. Like him. This is exactly what it is. Please, my friends, follow this man. Follow him inwardly and outwardly. Develop your ikhlaq like him. Develop yourself like him. Develop your personality like him. Learn ilm that he gave, that he passed on. That's the inheritance of the Prophet. Allahu Akbar. SubhanAllah. That's very interesting, isn't it? Prophet Sallallahu said, the ilm is my inheritance. Go and get his inheritance. And there is no better inheritance that you can get from anybody, any other thing. Get ilm, become person of ilm. Learn ilm, develop your, develop your ikhlaq, develop your personality, develop your hearts. Every single thing that Prophet Sallallahu has given, please take it on, please. For Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said in the Quran, مَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ Whatever Prophet Sallallahu gives you, take it. What ma? This ma is like anything. Whatever the Prophet gives you, take it. Whatever he stops you from, the stay away from that. What a general statement. Once a person came to say the Aisha radiallahu anha, he asked her about a masala. She was a faqiha. He asked her about a masala. And she told him that this, he said, I didn't find it in the Quran. What you're telling is not in the Quran. So she said that if you had studied Quran properly, you would have found that in the Quran. And he started thinking. I said, no, I, I don't, I, 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 I'm thinking I don't find it in the Quran. She said, didn't you find in the Quran, مَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ Whatever the Prophet gives you, take it. But if he asks you to stay away from, stay away from it. He said, yes. He said, this is what Prophet ﷺ has said. What I'm telling you. That it is as if it is in the Quran. Somebody asked Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, how was the ikhlaq of the Prophet ﷺ? She said, didn't you read the Quran? Kana khuluqu al-Quran. His character was Quran. Whatever was in the Quran, that was in his personality. So please, become people of Allah, follow this man, do ittiba. Every, in every single thing, become people of Allah, develop yourself. Complete submission, complete submission. The Sahaba had that complete submission of him. I've often, I love this incident, you know, I've often quoted that. That Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was standing in the masjid about to give khutbah, and Sahaba were standing. And he said to Sahaba, sit down, eat listen. Sayyidina Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu anhu was right at the back where the shoes are. And he sat down there. Abdullah, why are you sitting there? He said, Ya Rasulullah, you sat, sit down. I sat down. When you have heard your blessed words, your hukam, your command, sit down, how I could have, I could stand anymore. I sat down. This is their ittiba. This is their submission. On the day of Hajjatul Wada, 
Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the ninth of Zul Hijjah, he was giving the khutbah and he said that, Ayyu yawm in hadha, what day is that? Ayyu balad in hadha, what city is that? Ayyu shahr in hadha, what month is this? So the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and Majmain, they realized them, they knew the mizaj of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sometimes they knew that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is demanding an answer from us. And sometimes they knew that he is just asking the question to highlight the importance of these things. So these Sahaba said that in the jawab of that, Allah wa Rasuluhu A'lam. Allah and His Messenger knows the best. Which, sit, which day is that? Which, sit, which town is that? Which city is this? They said, what was their answer? Allah wa Rasuluhu A'lam. Allah and His Messenger knows the best. So when the Sahaba, they told Tabi'een that this is what we said, Tabi'een were very amazed. They said, that all you knew. You knew that which day is this, you knew that which city was that, you knew that which month was that. Why did you say Allahu wa Rasuluhu A'lam? That Allah and His Messenger knows the best. They said that if Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have said that this is Monday, we would have said this is Monday. If he would have said that this is Medina, we would have said this is Medina. If he would have said this is Muharram, we would have said this is Muharram. They were so submissive. At night, the Prophet ﷺ would say that this is day, they would say, yes, this is day. We don't care about this is darkness. This is how much submissive they were to the Prophet ﷺ. This is what we need to become. The maqam of lafweed, absolute submission. <coughs> Develop yourself, work on yourself. This is what's going to help. If you all want to go into paradise, become this person of paradise. Become like the Prophet ﷺ in your ahwal, in your ibadat, in your ikhlaq, in your end. We can never, ever, ever even leave the dust of what he had, but at least we should try to imitate, to copy this man. At least. So please, this is the man that we should remember every day, not only in Rabbi al because he had that perfection, balagun ula bi kamalihi, kashif al-duja bi jamalihi, hasunat jami'u khisalihi, sallu alayhi. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم فآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله أعشق نبي ميري دل من بي سما جانا عشق نبی میرے دل میں بھی سما جانا مجھ کو بھی محمد کا دیوانا بنا جانا مجھ کو بھی محمد کا دیوانا بنا جانا قدرت کی نگاہیں بھی جس چہرے کو تکتی تھی قدرت کی نگاہیں بھی جس چہرے کو تکتی تھی اس چہرائے انور کا دیدار کرا جانا جو رنگ کے جامی پہ رومی پہ چڑھایا تھا جو رنگ کے جامی پہ رومی پہ چڑھایا تھا اس رنگ کی کچھ رنگت 
मुझ पे भी चढ़ा जाना इश्क नबी मेरे दिल में भी समा जाना जिस खाब में हो जाए दीदारे नबी हासिल जिस खाब में हो जाए दीदारे नबी हासिल इश्क कभी मुझको नींद सी सुला जाना इश्क कभी मुझको नींद सी सुला जाना इश्क नबी मेरे दिल में भी समा जाना मुझको भी मोहम्मद का दीवाना बना जाना لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ربي أجعل الوفاء الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وبارك وسلم ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا فنكونن من الخاسرين ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الله لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنت من الله يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك يا مصرف القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكر إلينا الكفر والفسوق والإسياف وجعلنا من الراشدين اللهم آت نفوسنا تقواها وزكها أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها يا أرحم الراحمين يا أكرم الأكرمين يا كريم يا غفار يا رحيم يا ودود يا الله Ya Allah, please accept this gathering from all of us. Ya Allah, all of these people have come with ikhlas, with talab. Ya Allah, because of their sincerity, because of their talab. Ya Allah, please accept this gathering from all of us. Ya Allah, ignore my shortcoming, my lack of sincerity, my lack of adab. Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, please accept this gathering. Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, please. Ya Allah, tonight, Ya Allah, we do tawbah from all the things that we have been doing. Ya Allah, we have a tawbah. How many times we have done that? Ya Allah, we do it in the morning. We break it by the evening. We do it at night and we break it by morning. Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, make our tawbah. Tawbah in the soul. Please, make, give us consistency in our tawbah. Please, make us consistent on our tawbah until our death. Ya Arhamar Rahimi, Ya Akram al Ya Allah, despite of the fact that we have done tawbah so many times, that we have broken it so many times. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman Rahimi, we have not lost hope. Ya Allah, we again, this very night, tonight, Ya Allah, again do tawbah, Ya Allah. Please forgive us of our sins. 
Yeah, I'm lovely. Forgive us. Yeah, lovely. Forgive our sins. Yeah, yeah. Allah, give us the honor of your obedience. Yeah, Allah, save us from the disgrace of your disobedience. Yeah, Allah, please fill our hearts with no with light, with iman. Yeah, Allah, with ahwal, with ikhlas. Yeah, with rahimin. Yeah, Allah, with ilm. Yeah, with rahimin. Please also give us the portion of that ilm, of that ahwal, of those ikhlas. That we gave to the, your beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rabbah Rahimeen, Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, please, make us human beings. Ya Allah, make us Muslimin, make us Mu'mineen, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, make us people of Iman, please, make us people of Islam, please, make us people of Ihsan. Ya Rabbah Rahimeen, please, Ya Allah, accept all of us for the service of your deen. Ya Allah, Ya Rabbah Rahimeen. Please, Ya Allah, we know we are not worthy of serving your deen. But Ya Allah, we also know that it is not about qabiliyat, it is only about qabiliyat. Ya Allah, accept us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, the asbab that we need, Ya Allah, please provide them from your infinite treasures. With barakat, with afiyat, with khair, with musal. Ya Allah, please, in this time of sharaf fitna, please save us from all shurur and all fitna, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, every single day that passes, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, we see your new Ya Rahman Rahimeen. Ya Rahman Rahimeen, Ya Allah, Ya Allah people, Ya Allah, they are, Ya Allah, they are committing crime in the name of Islam, in the name of your deen. Ya Rahman Rahimeen, people who try to follow deen, Ya Allah, others look at them as if they are criminals. Ya Rahman Rahimeen, Ya Allah, truly your beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is right, he said, that Islam started as something strange and it, the time will come that it will become something that strange. And then he made a dua that Fatuba Lil Muraba that blessed are the strangers. Ya Allah please, Ya Allah though we look like strangers. Ya Allah people look at us as if we are criminals. But ya Allah. Ya Rahmarai, Ya Allah please shower all of us with your blessings. Ya Allah, Ya Rahmarai, please, Ya Allah please. Despite of the fact that the battle, Ya Allah, the, Ya Allah, the enemies of this team, they are trying their level best, Ya Allah, to, 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 to make this team notorious, Ya Allah, to harm this religion, but Ya Allah, we know that they can plan whatever they plan. Wa makaru, wa makar Allah, Allah khayrul maqi. Allah, we know that your plans are the best of the plans. Ya Rabban Rahimi. Ya Allah, please, we beg you, Ya Allah, that you keep all the people who are trying to disgrace your deen. Ya Allah, indeed, your deen can never be disgraced. Ya Allah, you please give ya Allah, honor to the believers, and you please give honor to this deen, and that you spread this deen in every single corner of the world, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, please guide people, Ya Allah, please use us, Ya Allah, to take this ya Allah, guidance to every single person on the face of the earth. Ya Allah, provide us with your protection. Save us from all the evils, Ya Allah. Save us from the jealousy of people, Ya Allah. Save us from the people who look like friends, but in reality they are enemies. Ya Allah, save us from the ill feelings of people. Save us from the hatred of people. Save us from all sorts of evil. Ya Allah, be it from any of the creation, Ya Allah. Please protect us, guide us, Ya Allah, use us, Ya Allah. Help us, Ya Allah, please, Ya for our generations as well. Ya Allah, the heart breaks just to think about this very fact. That Ya Allah, Ya Allah, there's so much pressure and fitna now, what will our generation going to face? Ya Allah, but there is only one hope, and that is the biggest hope, and that's you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, people can spread whatever they want, but Ya Allah, Ya Allah, if you bring anybody into your protection, Ya Allah, nobody can harm you. Ya Allah, we beg your help, we seek your protection, we seek your help, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, help us, our generations, to come every single person. Ya Allah, please, Ya Rahman Rahimi. Ya Allah, all the people who have asked for du'as, you know their needs, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, you will fulfill their needs from your infinite prayers, with barakat and afiyat and prayer. Ya Allah, people who are sick, spiritually or physically, Ya Allah, please grant the perfect cure, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, people who are in calamities, please remove those calamities from them. Allah, please protect the madaris, Ya Allah. Allah, please protect the madaris. Please protect the madaris. Please, Ya Allah, protect the khanaqahs where Ya Allah, teach your blessed name. Ya Allah, please protect
protect the work of that with the tree. Please protect all of our three harams, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahimeen. Please, Allah, anybody who is working for your deen, for the sake of, for, for your sake, Ya Allah, please. Ya Allah, protect them, guide them, Ya Allah, please provide them. Ya Allah, please give us your, Ya Allah, your happiness, your contentment, Ya Allah, in this dunya. Especially, Ya Allah, before our death, at the time of our death. Allow us to recite Kalima as our last words. Ya Allah. Allah, please make our graves in the gardens of paradise. Please make the question of the graves easy for us. Please, Ya Allah, fill our graves with noor. Allah, please make it spacious. <coughs> Save us from the punishment. Ya Allah, dunya, mother of Akhir. Ya Allah, please, on the day of judgment, please raise us from amongst your muqarrabi. Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, put all of us in the shade, under the shade of your throne. Please give us our books in our right hand. Please give us water from the blessed hands of your beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Please, Ya Allah, grant all of us his intercession. And let us all please enter into paradise and give us space in his blessed feet, Ya Allah, without threatening, without questioning. And Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, grant all of us your perfect vision, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we are indeed beggars. Ya Allah. You have said, Ya Yuhannas, Antumul Pumpara, O Ilallah, you are beggars in front of Allah. Ya Allah, we are those beggars who don't even know how to beg. Ya Allah, please, Ya Allah, please, without us even asking, you give us the best of the dunya, the best of the Akhir. Allow us to, Ya Allah, use our dunya for the sake of our Akhir. Rabbana taqabbal minna, inna ka.